G'day guys and welcome back to this week's episode of Patrol Talk. Today we're going to be talking about weights, important things that you should probably pack in your patrol, GVM upgrades and viscous fan art. So stay tuned guys as we kick on with today's Patrol Talk. talking about these viscous fan hubs. It seems that almost every second post on the Y62 forums or Facebook pages is something in regards to fan hubs. So it seems like the fresh batch of cars in from Japan have seemingly had issues with viscous fan hubs. So a viscous fan hub is a hub filled with a oil or a fluid of some description and it'll kick on when the computer tells it that it's getting a bit hot, it needs to turn on and it needs to start cooling down that radiator a bit more because there isn't enough airflow coming through and it's causing the car to get a little bit warm. Very good when it works well, um, but obviously a lot of people are starting to have issues with them. It just happens and unfortunately it's affected quite a large batch of patrols. What sort of a thing are people experiencing and how do you know if your fan hub is starting to play up? So typically on these cars when you first start them in the morning they will sound like a jet engine or a aircraft taking off. So the fan will start to spin up and um, It'll sound quite loud and it won't quite sound right. That's normal on the first startup. It may not happen every time and you know your experience may vary with it. Mine occasionally comes on from time to time, typically in an afternoon where I have the aircon on and I've just started the car. That's when I will notice it most. In the morning, it typically doesn't really happen. Um, sometimes it does and then it may kick on again um, you know, a couple hundred meters down the road um, and then it'll turn off and it'll go away and I typically will not hear it um, after that. So if you are experiencing issues, um, you'll notice things like when the fan does come on, you may notice a decrease in power, it may not turn off, um, it may just continue to run the whole length of your trip. Um, and if this is something that is occurring with your patrol, then it is, it is indicating that there is something going on with the fan hub. Now, there is quite a lengthy wait to get a new viscous fan hub from Nissan if you wanted to do it through warranty. Although there is other options out there um, if you're looking to spend you know, your own money and just get it fixed straight away. Now, it's not going to damage anything by having the fan hub run constantly um, over an extended period of time and will obviously wear out quicker but obviously there's an issue with it so that that won't be a problem so you can go on to websites like patrol apart that is definitely one that i would recommend as they typically stock a lot of genuine parts now i believe they do have some in stock so if you are having issues that may be an avenue to explore as i think the wait time for a new viscous fan hub from nissan is about eight weeks so if you can't wait that long, perhaps go to an external source to try and source a genuine one and either get it replaced by a genuine mechanic who has worked on patrols or four drives at least, or give it a crack yourself, it's not too hard. A few bolts, probably a sensor in there as well. And uh, you, know, you swap it out fairly easily. So hopefully that explains what is going on with these fan hubs. Obviously it's not affecting all patrols. But like I keep saying in every video, these things are so temperamental and it can happen at any point in the patrol's life. It's just one of them things and unfortunately, you know, it can happen regardless of the age of your car. That would be, you know, if you wanted to have some spare parts and things, you know, just in case something did happen, that would be definitely one that I would put on my list. All right, and that moves me into Another topic that I often talk about, and that would be the fact that the patrols do have issues. So, as we are all well aware, and if you are on the patrol forums or on the Facebook page or anything like that, every day they're getting bombarded with very similar questions, um, very similar faults, just constant. And like I have mentioned, they are you know, a fairly new car. And like I have mentioned, the previous models didn't really seem to have as many issues. Um, and they're definitely starting to experience 
I don't know, perhaps more issues now with the Series 4 and Series 5 than what they did previously. So, like I have mentioned also, I believe it may be down to the fact that the volumes of orders have increased and perhaps they are now rushing builds to get them finished quicker, to get them out to the customer quicker. Now this may lead to, you know, poor workmanship, um, you know, parts not being installed correctly, um, you know, not having the quality and control that they typically would. Because something you need to understand is the Japanese person is very meticulous, very perfect, very um, conscientious in the way that he goes about his work. They are very, very, very good um, manufacturers of pretty much anything that they create. And put that into perspective, uh, Nissan, Nissan's flagship supercar, or you know whatever you want to call it, the Nissan R35 GTR, that engine that is built, is hand built by a single dude or you know a couple of people in a hermetically sealed contained workspace that is dust proof on like microscopic levels. Like they are building those engines to such tight tolerances that they cannot have any type, type of minuscule piece of dust or dirt get into that facility to perhaps create, you know, tiny reliability issues down the track. So that sort of puts into to perspective the sort of workers or it's the sort of company that Nissan is. Now it is unfortunate that these things happen and, um, you know, what can you do about it other than you've got warranty, just go and get it fixed. Now, this isn't just isolated to Nissan. Toyota is having these issues as well, um, you know, issues that just shouldn't happen, you know, it's a brand new car and you are having issues 10,000 kilometers into the life of the vehicle, you know, it's pretty disappointing. Um, you know, like with my aircon line, it obviously wasn't pushed into its little bracket or holder correctly um, and it eventually rubbed through, causing me to lose all my aircon. Um, so, you know, it's little things like that that just should not happen, should be checked at the factory and then once the car is ready to be delivered, you know, that should be something that is checked. Now, I didn't even pick up on it because, you know, it's not even something that I thought, you know, would be an issue. Um, you know, you don't expect that sort of thing. The new Ford Rangers are having a lot of issues um, with cars that have done, you know, in the hundreds of kilometres. Not thousands, but a hundred. You know, like a hundred kilometres having issues. So they're having things like blown turbos, um, infotainment systems not working, um, and you know, other issues of that, that nature. Um, and, you know, Ford Australia, great company, built some awesome vehicles through its life. Um, rest in peace. Obviously Ford America outsources um, its building in Taiwan, um, I think Vietnam as well. And, you know, the sort of quality is sort of shown there. I don't believe that the workmanship is at the standard of what a Japanese car manufacturer is. Um, I mean, Toyota, for example, like you cannot deny that they are very reliable cars. Um, I mean, the Hilux has been an unkillable vehicle for decades. Um, you know, very, very good car. You cannot deny that fact. Doesn't matter what side of the fence you sit on. Um, you know, very, very reliable car. You know, if you think the patrols are bad, <laughs> just have a look at what's going on with the new ranges. And it's a shame, and I think it really just is coming down to the quality and control. They're just trying to pump out so many vehicles, um, and they're not getting checked as thoroughly as they typically would be. And, you know, it's hurting the consumer, and it's also hurting the, uh, the manufacturer as well, because, you know, they, they have to pay for this sort of stuff. Um, you know, it's coming out of their, their warranty stuff, so, you know, it's definitely putting pressure on them. Um, I think a way to change it is definitely better quality control. Um, just across the board, every manufacturer should be like that. Um, so, yeah, it's pretty disappointing, um, but it just is what it is, and, you know, this is why you have warranty on a vehicle, so, you know, use it. You know, Nissan can be quite difficult to deal with. I still have that check engine light on and you know, they still haven't replaced the O2 sensors, something so simple. 
I could have bought them from Patrol Part for, I don't know, I think they're $150 each, something like that. Um, so, you know, $300 for the two that I need, and I could have replaced it in, you know, under, under probably 40 minutes. Um, but, you know, you've got your warranty and they can be difficult to deal with, but all I can say is just use patience, call them every couple of days to remind them that, hey, I'm still waiting on this to be done. When will, you know, when will this be completed? You know, keep on pestering them about it because yeah, it's unfortunately the only way that things will get done. All right, so let's move into weights. So we know the patrols are quite heavy. So they're about 2.8 tons from the factory, around about um, with a full tank of fuel um, and one passenger. You sort of really need to think about what am I going to be using my patrol? Is it going to be a four wheel drive rig? Am I going to be towing with it? Am I going to be touring? Um, you know, am I going to tow things occasionally and, you know, use it as a bit of an all-rounder? And you, you need to appreciate the weights that that vehicle is going to be carrying. So there's a few options um, out there for uh, combating this, this weight issue. Obviously, there's GVM upgrades, which are great uh, for if you're going to be towing um, or, you know, caravanning and doing that sort of thing. Um, and it's definitely a worthwhile option because you will be overweight very easily. Very, very easily. And obviously, if you're just wanting to do some full driving and a bit of light towing work, um, you know, you don't have to worry too much. Um, the patrol will be fine for doing that, that sort of thing. Although, I would definitely look at upgrading to some heavier springs um, and perhaps doing some lower control arms as well. Don't have to be crazy billet ones, um, you know, just some stronger ones because the ones that are stocked with the car are quite weak. And I definitely want to have some beefier ones, especially even if you are four-wheel driving, because if you knock one of them on a rock or something, um, you know, pretty easy for them to be damaged, cause issues, um, alignments out of whack, all them sort of things. So having some stronger ones is definitely a very good idea. Now, if you do want to do some towing, um, like I did mention, you're definitely going to want to upgrade your GVM. Um, you know, you put a decent sized van on this and load the patrol up with people and gear and fuel and you're instantly over your GCM, which is not only illegal, it is very dangerous as well, which we'll get into a little bit later. So I thought I'd try and explain a little bit um, about GCMs, um, GVM, um, and what they all mean. So GVM is gross vehicle mass. So that is the gross mass that the vehicle can weigh when it is fully loaded up. That's its maximum that it can carry safely. The other one is GCM. There is a couple more out there, but for the simplicity of this, we'll just leave it to two. So GCM is gross combination mass. So that is the gross or the overall mass that the car and whatever you are towing can weigh. And if you exceed this, again, it is illegal and dangerous. My work is involved in uh, heavy trucks and our vehicles are all overweight, all oversized, all over mass and this is a big part of our job and managing this um, and you know keeping on top of our, our weights of our loads and that sort of thing. And something to really keep in mind is you know you might think oh you know I'm a couple hundred kilos over my GCM you know What's it going to matter? <laughs> it does matter. You know, you're driving along and you're on holidays and, um, you know, you're driving in the middle of nowhere and, you know, you blow a tyre because the weight of the tyre can't accommodate for, for the extra weight that you have put onto it. So you blow a tyre and you can very easily lose control of a vehicle from a blown tyre. Now you have your family's life in your control, you have the lives of others on the road in your control, and if because of your stupidity and uh, arrogance, you're not wanting to upgrade your vehicle to be safe and compliant on the road, then that's on you. You know, if you go through all the policies and procedures and you do the right thing, and something unfortunate happens, it's an unfortunate accident and you know you learn your lesson assuming everything you know comes off um, and no one's injured or anything like that you know you learn a very valuable lesson reevaluate your options and you upgrade things to be better for the future now that's a big thing you know everyone likes to go away and it seems nowadays we're always loading up with big fridges and 
you know, for these, it's fuel. If you want to do some long distance trips, maybe remote. Um, you know, we a lot of people like to have their necessities that you know they think are essential to having on the road, like just dumb things like kettles and toasted sandwich makers and and you know things that you really just do not need. And you know, this extra stuff is making you know cars more overweight. Um, and you know, is very dangerous on the road. You have four wheels, four brake rotors, and that needs to, you know, slow down, you know, six and a half tons of vehicle, all right? Now you may be lucky enough to have electronic brakes um, or electronic brake controller that will allow you can, to control the brakes of your trailer. Um, and you know, that greatly improves what you can tow. So your braking, system is something that will definitely need an overhaul and I hope all these uh, GVM um, manufacturers are looking at brakes and upgrading them as well because you know the stock brakes are good on the patrol but if it's unladen and fairly you know not loaded up they'll stop beautifully you know <laughs> I am actually very impressed with these brakes on the patrol and brakes are something that I froth over I love trying to upgrade brakes and trying to get the best out of them and trying to find the best combination of pad and rotor to try and make a really effective braking system. And I, I achieved that very well on the Falcon I had, the turbo. The brakes on that were excellent and I knew that whatever speed I was doing that I would be able to pull up extremely fast in case of an emergency. And that's something to think about on these cars. You know, you drive along and it's so easy to drive and wow, the power is amazing and it's always there when I need it. But what about the power when you need to stop? You know, what sort of braking power do you have when you need to stop the vehicle very quickly in an emergency? You know, these are big cars. They don't feel it when you drive it. And you know, I drive this thing like it's the Falcon or try to at least. Um, but. You know, it's always in the back of my mind, especially when it's wet, that, you know, this is a big car and, you know, I can't drive it like a race car. You know, this thing, it likes to wallow around on the road and, yeah, it's comfortable and very nice to drive, but in the case of an emergency, um, you know, you really have to be on it. Um, you know, and your brakes should definitely be something that you need to be considering. All right, so let's have a chat about our options for GVM upgrade. So there's quite a few manufacturers out there nowadays that are doing these as it obviously becomes more important that, you know, people are actually doing this sort of stuff, um, you know, to make sure they're safe out on the road. Um, so I've picked, you know, the, the more popular ones out there that are doing these sort of things. Um, so yeah, let's run through that. So first on our list is DMW. Um, I definitely would recommend DMW. They've been doing this for a long time, not only on patrols, but on land cruisers as well. So they definitely do have the experience. Um, and they're also the cheapest option um, on the list as well for what you get. So the DMW one starts at $7,180. Um, they upgrade your lower control arms, do some stronger suspension components, do a diff cover that protects the rear diff, and they have a GVM upgrade to 4,499 kilos, which is really good. Um, they do airbags and heavier springs as well, which is great, obviously, when you're carrying that extra load. Um, you're definitely going to you know, need them sort of things to help make sure your car's level is safe and you're not going to wear things out prematurely. So they're definitely a really great option. Next one on the list is more 4x4. Um, they do a 4200 kilo um, GBM upgrade, so a bit less than what DMW is offering. Um, although theirs is 9500 so quite a bit more expensive. Um, and that gives you a GCM of 7700 kilos. So, you know, you can nearly tow eight tons with that or have a gross combination mass of nearly eight tons, which is awesome. Um, you know, people are probably definitely um, getting up there out on the roads with, um, you know, with them sort of weights quite easily with a big van. You can choose your spring, um, how heavy your springs you want, which is great. I like that they give you a flexibility with your options. So that's really good. Another thing I like is they do camber and caster adjustment bushes which allows you to have better uh, adjustability with your alignment, um, which is awesome and definitely a big positive for these because we know how temperamental they can be with, um, with doing alignment. So that's really great and gives you, um, allows you to be really spot on with that. 
They do front upper control arms as well, which is great. Um, you know, it's all well and good to upgrade the rear, but you know, you need to also give attention to the front. Um, and they do a lower control arm upgrade, which they reckon is rated to 2,450 kilos, which is pretty good over the rear axle. Um, so that does give you a bit of room to play with as well. They also recommend, um, and this is a big thing as well, uh, when you are doing this, um, and something to consider if you are loading up your patrol, is if you are getting aftermarket wheels, you need to make sure that they are rated to, you know, a kilo that is going to work for you. So they recommend 1,274 um, 1, kilos is what they recommend for an aftermarket wheel, which yes, does limit your options. Although there are some still good looking wheels out there that are rated to that. Um, and I definitely recommend that as, you know, you do not wheel, want wheel damage um, by overloading the car. Um, it's just unsafe and, you know, it's just silly. Um, so definitely look into your weights and um, your wheel options as well. It's very important. So another one on the list is ASG 4x4. They do a 55mm front spring lift, which is great if you've got accessories on the front of the car. It'll help to keep it nice and level. They do a 50mm um, rear lift um, with either 150 or 250 kilo springs, and you can go more if you wish. Um, I'm not sure about their suspension upgrades, didn't really go into detail about that, although I would assume that they do lower control arms at the very least, um, as you know, it is a requirement. Um, their price, unknown, I'm not sure what their prices are. You'd obviously have to get in contact with them to find out a price and run through your options and stuff that you want which is good when you want to customize something to suit what you're doing, which is great. Um, another really popular one too is on track. They do a 4,085 kilo GBM upgrade. So quite a bit less than what DMW is offering, um, but probably a pretty good mid sort of option. If you don't want to go super heavy, you're not towing a massive van. Um, perhaps you're just doing some four drive work and you know, some light towing, that sort of thing, just to make sure that you've got plenty of wiggle room and you know, you're keeping your vehicle safe, which is what it's all about. Um, they have a must where you have to upgrade your um, springs to 200 kilos, do a lift, and also do uh, billet lower control arms. That's what they recommend. Um, that's what they want you to do. Um, and I think it's great to have uh, a manufacturer or a company that is saying, you know, look, we're putting, you know, liability out there. We're, vouching that our product is safe. We want you to do these things to ensure that we um, keep that um, liability down to a very small margin and that we are keeping our customers safe by you know, using good quality parts um, and making sure that you know, they're upgraded to past what we are doing. And that's a massive thing too. You, know, you can upgrade your parts and you know, be so close to being over what they're rated to. Um, and you know, that'd be okay. But what I would recommend doing is saying, right, I've got this that I want to do. This is a part that I can upgrade it with. Uh, but I'm going to go past that, what I want, well past that. So I have plenty of wiggle room and I'm not going to run into dramas. If I say, you know, for example, I want to do something that's a little bit different to what I typically do, I know that I'm going to be safe and have that wiggle room to be able to accommodate that. They're, just for reference, the billet control arms for a pair of $3,600. Um, so quite pricey, but you know, when it comes to strength and safety, you know, there really isn't a price to pay for that. You know, you know that sort of stuff is priceless. Um, so paying that sort of a price for something that's going to last is very strong and we'll make sure that you know, you're know you safe while towing. Um, yeah, definitely well worth it. There is cheaper options out there that are okay still, much better than the factory um, setup that you have, which, you know, again, depending on what you are doing with your car will you know constitute what you know parts you should be buying. If you're going crazy and you're towing a 22 foot van and you're loading up your car and you've got you know family in the car as well, just bite the bullet, pay the price, get it done properly the first time but you know, perhaps you're just driving around with a box trailer occasionally, you know, perhaps for work you use this and you've got a little trailer that carries around all your tools, you know, upgrading to something like a forged lower control arm, completely fine. 
Um, won't have the strength as a billet, but it's definitely stronger than um, you know the factory component. Also, engineering, that's another cost that comes into it as well and does vary state by state, so something to look into um, before you do this. Contact these manufacturers and companies and ask them you know, what other people typically do, what they recommend um, you doing, and you know, read up on the legalities and things, because every state's different um, and they require different things. So definitely do your research before you go into to doing these sort of things, because it'll save you a lot of hassle in the end. So let's move into the car now and have a look at uh, the placard and what it tells us about what the patrol can do. I do apologize for the wind noise. It's uh, definitely picked up this afternoon. But this is some good information inside the vehicle um, and it'll also probably be in the, the, um, the manual as well. And if you get stuck and you're not sure about, you know, what information is legitimate or, you know, if you are unsure about um, these sort of things about your car, just look in the car or look in the manual because you're getting it straight from the manufacturer and you can't go too wrong with that information. So we'll start off here. As you can see, this is the tow, tow bar information. If you did have it fitted with a genuine Nissan tow bar, I don't, but you know, this um, tells you the part number um, for that tongue tow that you need um, and what it is referencing to in regards to these figures. So the max download weight or the maximum uh, tow, ball, tow ball weight is 350 kilos. Now you can get um, proper like tow ball um, measuring devices that go under the tow ball and do measure the actual weight of the downward um, downward weight on the on the tow ball so that's your maximum there and the rated capacity of the tow bar is uh, 3500 kilos as I've mentioned these cars will will tow that um, but like I have also mentioned um, it will wear things out quickly and you know it's not the safest to do that with a stock vehicle um, so this is why we do the GVM and um, you know it's a safety reason. Um, also this is our unbraked and braked um, stock figures here so obviously un an unbraked trailer so unbraked means a trailer that does not have brakes is 750 kilos so it's you know a fairly small box trailer perhaps you're going to get some dirt for the garden on the weekend um, so that's your unbraked one. Um, and that's your braked, so a trailer with brakes, um, and that is 3,500 kilos again. Um, so obviously that's your max rated capacity for the tow ball. And like I did mention before, cool, you can do it, but you probably wouldn't want to be bang on the button at 3,500 kilos, um, as you probably will run into issues. And obviously, it you know goes on to say, do not exceed the gross vehicle mass, do not exceed the gross combination mass, do not exceed the maximum permissible rear axle weight, and refer to the owner's manual or Nissan for GVM, GCM, and um, the permissible rear axle weight as well. Um, Nissan does not recommend the fitting of load leveling or weight distribution devices when using a genuine tow bar, and that's a big thing that does come up as well. Um, people do ask, can I use distribution devices uh, when towing? Um, Nissan recommends no with their genuine tow bar. Perhaps there is one out there that does. Let me know if there is. I'd be interested to know that. Um, but with the genuine one, Nissan does say no, um, as it is actually dangerous, even though the whole idea of the device is for safety um, and emergencies and that sort of thing. But Nissan says no. Um, it obviously causes issues with the car or whatever. Now in your table of contents you'll notice that there's a sticker in here which um, goes in to say don't add anything on the front of the car that is equal to 85 kilos as this may do damage to the car. That's pretty important when you're fitting you know spotlights or a bull bar to the vehicle um, because obviously you don't want to overload the front axle weight um, as it's obviously quite close to what it is uh, safely meant to be. The most bull bars out there are about 65 kilos, around that, uh, a little bit less in some cases. Um, but yeah, definitely keep an eye on your front weights because it's obviously an issue. Because um, they put this little thing in here to... And to figure out what your um, gross vehicle mass is, um, you take it to a weigh bridge or you can use weigh scales, something like that to give you an idea of what the car um, accurately weighs. Um, now they're pretty good, you know, some are within a few kilos, some are within, you know, 10 
kilos and some are a little bit less accurate you know up to 50 kilos difference um, which you know isn't great try and find a really accurate one um, there is public way bridges um, all around the place so yeah do your research um, onto that because it's definitely very beneficial to know what your car weighs because then you know what you can and can't do um, obviously weigh it when the car is full of fuel and if you can with the amount of people that you would typically carry um, because this will give you the most accurate weight as well it'll give you three different figures it will give you a front axle weight a rear axle weight and then the combination of the both so um, do do your research and figure out you know what's a safe uh, weight limit on the front and what is safe on the rear and you know do the math combine them together and you'll get your gross vehicle mass um, like I mentioned it's very important to know that because you know it'll give you an idea of what you can do to the car so let's move into the rear of the car and let's talk about some things that you should pack you know at a bare minimum if you're going away and, and doing a trip obviously you use your best judgment and you know you decide on the things that you're going to need but you know as a bare minimum this is sort of pretty much what i carry so i've got a few luxury items in here i've got the uh, old oz trail um, table in here it's fairly lightweight um, doesn't weigh too much you know probably maximum five kilos with this bad boy um, and you know this all comes down to um, <laughs> this whole gvm thing you know pick things that are lightweight because the extra couple of kilos and stuff that you save could be the difference between you know being illegal and and not being um and you know and being legal um so pick your accessories carefully and your camping equipment as well and you know if you've got shit that you don't need don't take it i've got the air compressor obviously air compressors can weigh a bit this is probably a good 10 kilos of air compressor there so you know that's an extra 10 kilos to the the, uh, the GVM. Um, obviously there's plenty of different options for air compressors out here. This is a, uh, a cheaper one that I got from um, from Super Cheap Auto. Um, I think it's an XTM or something. Yeah, an XTM one. Um, it's actually pretty decent for the price and was 200 bucks or something, but um, got it on a, a good club deal, which brought it down to 100 bucks, something like that. So I thought, you know, for the meantime, before I get an ARB one or something a bit um, smaller to be able to tuck up in here, uh, this will be great for going to the beach and, and doing that sort of thing. And then I have a box of just random crap as well. I've got a small socket set in case I need to do any small work. Um, and if you do plan on going away, I would take a you know at least a socket set to be able to do um, you know a bigger one than this just to do things that um, you know might be able to get you out of trouble. Obviously, I've got the airline here for the compressor, quite a large one, which is nice. Um, I've got a, a large winch rope in here um, that I need to not have in here. Um, I obviously don't have a winch, so it's not necessary, but I thought, you know, this would probably be a good spare winch rope in case something does happen one day. Um, so I've kept it in the car. Um, moving a bit further down... I've got some pliers and um, I've got a, a bottle jack in there as well. I've got some jumper leads in case I may need to use them. And the thing is, you know, I pack things that I'm not really going to need, but somebody else may need them. And that's another thing too, you know, you bring some extra things that, you know, you can use, but also help someone get out of trouble as well if they need to. Um, I've got some soft shackles in here as well um, and a snatch strap in there. Um, obviously still in the packet because the patrols don't get bogged. Um, the Phillips head screwdriver, there's a flat head screwdriver in here too. Um, I've got some tie down straps, a uh, sort of like a tiny little breaker bar. Um, and, you know, I've got other little bits and pieces in there. I've got a um, tire tire gauge as well for deflating tires. Um, you know, I also have um, quite an extensive trauma kit in the car as well. Because like I said, you know, it's nice to have these things for yourself, but you know, you may be able to save somebody else's life um, or provide good first intervention um, in case something happens to someone. Um, I have an extension and I also have the socket that undoes the wheel nuts. 
Uh, that's very important to have, and I like to have an upgraded one as well um, over the stock one because, you know, it's just better. Uh, flathead, and there's some more junk down the bottom there. Watch this. Got my antenna bracket. That's where I got mine from. If you want to get an antenna bracket for your UHF, um, also have a fire extinguisher in the car because I mean you just never know when things go wrong and if you can be prepared and have the things then you know you're going to be better off than everyone else. Having these things is really good to have and you may never have to use them but in the case that you do need to at least you do have them in the car. Um, so we'll move into the little storage bay. So in here I've got my first aid, I've got a St. John's first aid kit which is you know got all your good stuff in there, snake bite kit, um, it's quite a large one, obviously this is for a vehicle accident so it's got um, a lot of different things in it, you know dressings, band-aids, trauma shears, bandages, um, plenty of good stuff in there that you may need, um, gloves, tape, um, Plenty of bandages and, and that sort of thing. Um, obviously in Australia, having a snake bite um, kit is very helpful as well. Something you should always carry in your vehicle. Um, you never know when a snake is gonna bite you on the leg. And I also have a trauma kit as well. Um, in the case that, you know, things get really out of hand and you come across a really nasty car accident or something like that. Um, you know, I've got bandages, um, I've got uh, gloves, I've got cat tourniquets, I've got, um, you know, sterile dressings, um, SAM, uh, SAM seals for um, punctured lungs, triangle bandages, lube, um, casualty cards, um, you know, these sort of things here are great for when uh, paramedics take over um, you know if you can write down all the details and stuff about um, what has happened to the patient and hand that to the ambulance um, you know that saves them a heap of work um, and they can just crack straight on um, nasopharyngeal airways um, in case you know somebody has a really traumatic mouth injury um, chuck that in the nose and breathe again um, so you know this is overkill, um, for sure, um, but like I mentioned, you know, if something does really go wrong and, you know, you're not prepared, well, then people die. Um, but if you can, you know, have crap that is sort of unnecessary and, um, you know, one day it may come in handy, um, just for your information, cat tourniquets cannot be used in Australia. It is illegal to use them for whatever reason even though they're an awesome tool and uh, if you did use one on someone and it saved their life I would be very disappointed if you got in trouble for using one um, if you don't know they're obviously used to stop um, really bad bleeding hemorrhages um, you know bleeding that cannot be stopped by a typical bandage um, so that is placed high and tight on the limb um, and obviously not around the neck because that's not ideal um, and that will um, clamp an artery or a uh, major vessel and stop or hopefully stop the bleeding um, so they're good to have but yeah use them at your own risk and then obviously under here there's nothing but the stock crap that uh, is useless so this is what I typically carry in the car and what I like to have in here. I like knowing that um, I have the equipment to be able to recover myself or somebody else, have some stuff that if I want to set up randomly, um, I can have a table and be comfortable. I can inflate my tires. I can save someone's life. I have a fire extinguisher in the front that can stop the car from burning to the ground, hopefully, probably not. But, you know, I have these things um, to keep myself safe, preserve life, and, you know, perhaps um, help somebody else from having, you know, a shit day. But in saying that, all this stuff is extra weight, and getting your car weighed is very important and something I would highly recommend that people do um, because you just never know when 
um, you know you have to carry something heavier and all of a sudden now you're overweight so guys I hope you've gotten something out of today's video if there's information that I've gotten wrong or something that you know to be different please let me know I'm, I'm happy to be proved different if you have a different opinion or whatever let's have a civil discussion about it you know because um, you know best way of learning is to talk about it and um, find other people's experiences and opinions and I'm more than happy to um, to talk to you about you know something that I may have gotten wrong may have made a mistake you know I'm not perfect um, I'm just trying to provide the info that I know and that I've, I've I've researched so if I've gotten something wrong more than happy to discuss that but thank you so much for watching guys I hope that has cleared things up and perhaps made things easier for you perhaps it's given you uh, a better understanding about how all this stuff works because it is quite confusing um, and also provides you with some um, good options for a GVM upgrade um, quite a good selection of companies out there nowadays that are doing them so you know do your research check your weights see what you need to do and um, call places email them and discuss it with them because they're the experts thank you so much for watching guys make sure you comment and subscribe if you are new like the video if you've enjoyed today's episode and make sure you let me know with your questions and queries about what you want to see next more than happy to include that in next week's episode so like always guys stay safe out there and i will catch you in next week's episode